maximum expected flight pressure. And what that amounts to is that's 8% uh, that's of the 1.4 safety factor, and that's the convention in solid rocket motor uh, technology. Excuse me, on, uh, on what do you apply this 112% uh, proof test? Uh, segments. Each, each the, production each, segment? Each segment. Thank you. Does the uh, term limit load apply to the uh, uh, ultimate strength of the material or the yield point or what? Uh, that's In ultimate. Words, there, that would be yeah. that would be ultimate, and uh, uh, that would be you know breaking up. It, it, you would you, the requirement is that you don't break up at less than 1.4 times the maximum expected load. You don't have an ultimate break failure. Up. Right. Thank you. Uh, then we have done uh, X-ray, and we did 100% X-ray of the of the propellant in the first 68. Si excuse me, 68 segments that were manufactured, and through that verified that the casting process uh, that we were using provides proper propellant strength. Uh, currently, we, uh, we use the process control that we verified with those 100% x-rays, and we do a random monthly x-ray of a segment. Uh, and then whenever we have a process anomaly, a process change, or design change, then we do uh, an x-ray for the segments. And then we do, we still do 100% x-ray of the nozzle bladed parts to assure that there aren't any uh, D-lambs or, or voids or cracks. At, at what time are these x-rays taken uh, in comparison, that is, in, in relation to the dates of uh, delivery and uh, mission? I'll have to I'll have to get you the information. Uh, I could get it. Uh, I can get you the information on these specific segments that uh, that we flew. Uh, I'm not even sure of the manufacturing time. They may not have been 100% X-ray because it may have been after we instituted this random sampling. But I will give you a typical example of uh, of when the X-ray was taken and when it was flown. Are the three forward segments interchangeable? Are they? The, the, the forward-most segment, and I'm not familiar with exactly how we do all these segment changes, but the, the length of the forward-most segment is, is, is long, well, it's longer. And also, you got a dome, a forward dome on that segment. So there's not complete interchangeability between these segments. But, uh, uh, you know, when we, when we take these back and refurbish them, you know, we do wash out the propellants and the liners and start all over again and then, you know, remake the factory joint. And I'm just not sure how we can interchange those. But, but that's, you know, that's kind of data that we can provide to you. Uh, now, that's, uh, that's all I had on the booster. I want to comment that, uh, that there was questions earlier, and I think the gentleman who was asking the question has left. This question earlier about, uh, I think he phrased it, a concern by Thacol on uh, low temperatures. We did have a meeting with Thacol. We had a telecom discussion uh, with people in Huntsville, uh, people at the Wasatch Division, and people at KSC. And the discussion centered around the integrity of the O-rings under lowered temperature. Uh, we had the, the project managers from both Marshall and Thacol in the discussion. We had the chief engineers from both places in the discussion. And Thacol recommended uh, to proceed in the lodge. So they did recommend lodge. But we had a meeting where there was some concern about the cold temperatures. When was that meeting? That was month, the 27th. Uh, it started uh, uh, around uh, quarter to five central time. Okay. Uh, then going on to, uh, is there anything else on the booster? Guess not. Thank you. Okay. Going on to the external tank project, uh, <clears throat> Arnie has talked uh, uh, a great deal already about this, and, and uh, I think you realize that the that the uh, the LOX tank is uh, forward, the oxygen tank's forward, and we have the inner tank, which has a large uh, uh, cross beam, which takes out the thrust from the SRMs. The SRMs are attached on the sides here to this large cross beam. And that's where all the thrust is reacted into the external tank through the inner tank. And then the hydrogen tank is the, the aft tank, uh, uh, which is separated from the oxygen tank by the inner tank area. 
And then we have uh, the, uh, the GOX, the gaseous oxygen, oxygen pressurization line that runs the length of the vehicle up to the top of the, uh, of the uh, LOX tank. We also have a cable tray that runs up to the top of the uh, LOX tank. And that cable tray uh, has uh, wirings, uh, wires, electrical wires, as well as uh, it has a linear-shaped ch uh, charge in it. This uh, feed line, the oxygen feed line, comes out of the inner tank, well, it comes from the LOX tank, into the inner tank, and then out at this point and feeds down the side of the uh, hydrogen tank, external to the hydrogen tank, uh, into the orbiter. The hydrogen feed line comes directly out of the bulkhead into the orbiter. Uh, the hydrogen pressurization and the, and the oxygen pressurization lines are just adjacent to that feed line, uh, the oxygen feed line, and then, uh, then, then the cable tray comes. And then I think Arnie's already discussed the attached structure that we have uh, uh, back here. This aft ring uh, is where the <coughs> orbiter uh, loads are reacted, plus uh, this thrust launch line that goes up into this uh, next forward ring. And then the uh, SRB rear attach points come also into that aft ring. Excuse me, what's the purpose of the linear shape charge you just Well, that's about? rain safety destruct in the event that there's a problem. Yeah. Where is it located? Uh, it's in this uh, cable tray, and I'm not really sure where the charge starts, but uh, you know it runs up the vehicle, and, and I'm not sure of the total length, but it's 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 actually in that cable tray. Active cooling. Okay, that's really all I wanted to say about the external tank. I think we I think we've covered everything. But what uh, loads uh, is it designed to? Uh, the uh, this Mike line. The uh, the external tank loads. Is this Michael? Yes, okay. that's right. The external tank loads. <clears throat> uh, when we first began the program, we had a safety factor of 1.4 on all loads. Uh, we had a weight reduction program in which we took 8,000 pounds out of the tank, and uh, we we used various methods to get that 8,000 pounds out. At the time that we that we did that exercise and that engineering analysis. Uh, we had already uh, done the uh, loads testing on the standard weight tank that we started out with, so we knew the load pass very well. Uh, and so what we did was that we took loads which uh, we uh, considered to be well-defined loads, for example, a pressure load. And we said that since we know that load so well and with our experience at that time, plus the structural testing that we had already done, plus the, the, you know, the proof testing that we do of those tanks, that we would design that structure to 1.25. The other structure, which is determined by uh, thrust gimbling loads or aerodynamic loads, wind loads, are still, that, that structure is still designed to the 1.4. When did these lighter tanks get into service? Uh, STS-8. Is that right? STS-8. Well, I guess the uh, next chart I had on the tank, uh, uh, of course, Mark Marietta is the uh, prime contractor, and we got major subcontractors as, as listed there. And then uh, we did uh, a lot of the testing, most of the testing at, uh, at Marshall, uh, including these structural tests and modal survey tests and, and, and various thermal protection system activities that I've got indicated there. And I would say, too, that the, the requirements, and I don't think I've got that on a, on a chart. Do I have another chart? The, uh, excuse me just a minute, I think I've got my charts all mixed up here. I can't see the screen. <laughs> okay, chart 25. Uh, well, this, this really answers the question, I guess, it was just asked. I, I've got down there three sigma loads, and that's a statistical term, doesn't mean anything. That's the maximum predicted flight loads. Uh, that's our requirement, and there is a loads data book, and I think Dick Coors is going to talk about, uh, or, or Tom Mosier, I think, is going to talk about uh, how we do that as far as the, uh, the requirements are concerned. But anyhow, it's designed uh, to the maximum predicted flight loads, and, and then we, uh, we do qualification tests to 1.25 and 1.4, as I just mentioned, depending on the circumstance. And then uh, uh, in that testing, we do it at... Uh, uh, cryogenic temperatures for the hydrogen tank and room temperature for the uh, oxygen tank and the inner tank. And the propulsion uh, system as far as the interface requirements, delivering the proper propellants to the orbiter and to the uh, main engine, 
is qualified by testing that we've done, and, but in particular the main propulsion test, which I've already mentioned we've run twi uh, 12 of. And then the uh, thermal protection system, uh, that's there to maintain the uh, propellant uh, quality to uh, make sure you've got proper temperatures for engine operation, avoid propellant boil off, that type of thing. Uh, to thermally protect the structure in certain areas, areas of high heating, like for example now we have an ablator underneath the, uh, the uh, LOX feed line over uh, where we do have external mold line protuberances. And then also to limit ice formation to avoid uh, damaging the orbiter. And then we've qualified that through wind tunnel testing, both uh, combined environments and also putting uh, plasma arc heat lamps on, uh, heating sources on there to make sure that we've got the proper recession rates. As far as previous flights are concerned, has the external tank been successful or has it been the source of trouble, generally speaking? The, the, the external tank, I, th I personally feel like that we've had uh, very good success with. We've been, we've had some problems with some pressure transducers. And uh, these are uh, just uh, fairly rare occurrences. I think we've had like uh, two LOX ullage transducer uh, bias shifts. They're just very small changes. But, but what, is it, what does that mean? Well, it, we have in, uh, in the, the, uh, in the oxygen tank, we have four pressure transducers that measure the amount of uh, pressure that's in the tank, and then those pressure sensors are used to control uh, the gaseous oxygen control valves on the orbiter. And uh, on the hydrogen tank, uh, we also have uh, pressure transducers, and they, and they control uh, liquid hi uh, gaseous hydrogen uh, control valves on the orbiter. Are they, you know, they feed back information as to the pressure, and then those valves open or close based on what the pressure is. Uh, the problem we've had is that we've had some, uh, when we sit uh, uh, at one uh, tanking load for a long period of time, these sensors tend to vibrate, and we're not really sure what the cause of it is. And we found that the vibration is causing perhaps shorting between lines or contamination between the wiper and the coil, and it's given us like a tenth of a PSI or, or half PSI offset. Uh, the, the main concern here is, uh, is that we'll violate a launch commit criteria because we have to, uh, at T minus 31 seconds, we have to have three of these transducers uh, before we go. And so uh, we never have really considered that to be a problem as far as safety of flight was concerned. Can I ask a question about uh, venting? Um, are there vent valves uh, on when the uh, tank is sitting on the launch pad? Uh, yes, I'd, but I'd like to, to defer that question to Bob Seek. I think he could answer it much better than I could about uh, what happens on the pad. If there are no further questions, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, we will, at your request, provide you any of the detailed briefings on the specific elements of this at the center or wherever you need to get more detailed information on uh, the 51L situations of hardware. I ask our people to make sure they gave the commission today a good oversight and an overview of what each of the elements of the shuttle uh, yeah. was. Well, I'm so. sure that all commission members understand that. As I said, we, we appreciate the fact that you've been able to assemble all this information on sh such short notice. So. Please don't be apologetic no, for uh, not being an able to answer all of these questions, which we'll have plenty of opportunity to ask yes. later on. And yes. Thank you, sir. Next, I'd like to uh, continue on with a major element of our program, and that's the ground operations work and getting ready for a launch. The activities that you'll see presented here by Mr. Robert Seek, of, uh, Director of Shuttle Operations at the Kennedy Space Center, will be applicable to STS-51L as they are in terms of how we process all the particular flights. So, Bob? I do. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, I'm Bob Seek, Director of Shuttle Operations at the Kennedy Space Center responsible for the conduct of the shuttle processing at Kennedy. Today I'm going to give a very general overview of that facilities and the operations we perform within them. Next chart. This is an aerial map. Panel. TV. 
which has four months to put together a report on the ill-fated mission of the Challenger Space Shuttle on January 28th. I might mention one of the major concerns which has been voiced both this morning and this afternoon is the concern about low temperatures on January 28th, the day the Challenger was launched. There were icy conditions at the launch pad. However, NASA is insisting, as it has insisted before, that the cold temperatures in no way created a safety concern for the shuttle or for its astronauts aboard. The witness is Robert Seek, director of the shuttle management and operations team at the Kennedy Space Center. We'll go back now to the Washington National Academy of Sciences. It's basically a three-mile runway with standard aircraft navigation aids. And we have a microwave scanning beam system for the auto land capability, which the orbiter has, has not demonstrated yet as part of its, uh, its operation. Next chart. We've had five landings of orbiters from orbit at Kennedy. Next chart. But this is the way the Challenger arrived after its last mission, which was in November of 85. Came in on our carrier, carrier aircraft to our mate demate device. Next chart. Of course, put it on the runway, extend the landing gear, and we tow it to the orbiter processing facility. Next chart. And that's the, the next area which I will address. Next chart. This is a view of the orbiter processing facility, basically two hangars with extensive checkout and access equipment. It gives us the capability to essentially totally refurbish the orbiter uh, with the exception of very major structural mods. This is where most of our workforce is concentrated. Most of our activity in a turnaround is conducted on the orbiter because of the complexity of that hardware in one of these two high bays. Next chart. A few words about the capabilities there. Essentially, we can access every compartment on the vehicle, and we can test it remotely using our launch processing system. The principal activity here, of course, is, is with Lockheed, primarily the refurbishment after a flight. Next chart. The operations there on a standard turnaround, approximately three to four weeks. We do all of the things that you see here essentially in parallel to maximize, uh, to minimize the time really that we spend in this facility. Uh, characteristically, after a mission, we safe the vehicle, and this was the case with Challenger. There were no major anomalies there. We did our deservicing of the hazardous consumables, uh, went into our main engine inspections, uh, which is one of the critical items that we perform, and reconfiguration of the payload bay for the next mission. Uh, all of that processing was normal. This particular turnaround flow of Challenger was a little bit longer than normal because we took the opportunity to put in some of the modifications required on Challenger to fly the Centaur interplanetary missions, which would have been in spring of this year. Tile operations are something that we contend with each turnaround, and we start those as soon as we roll in, and they proceed through till OPF rollout. And next chart gives you somewhat of an idea of the access in there. Uh, we totally surround the orbiter with access platforms and support equipment. Next chart. We do perform payload integration for horizontally installed payloads in the orbiter processing facility. In this case, we did not do that, but we did have to remove the space lab from the previous mission. Next chart. And that is a picture of the space lab. Next chart, some of the tile work. The next chart, I'm going to talk a little bit about the processing of the solid rocket motors and the, the solid rocket booster segments. Next chart. These are the facilities that, that we perform that in, the, the triangle, the buildings, and the, uh, the bottom of the picture. We have two surge facilities, and we have what we call a rotation and processing facility. Next chart. The, the segments are brought in on rail car. They're horizontal. We remove them with the crane, uh, bring them into the processing facility, perform an inspection on all the interfaces, and then we move the segments in and stack them in sequence in one of our two surge facilities. Next chart. This is a photograph of some of the operations in the processing facility. Again, no checkout in here, storage and inspection only. 
Next chart. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our mobile launch platform, the particular one used in the Challenger mission. I'll have to get you the exact number, but we have used it for approximately half of our previous launches. Next chart. Basically, it provides the launch mount for the shuttle vehicle. As was explained before, the solid rocket boosters are bolted to this launch mount. And it is moved around. Next chart. That's the mobile launch platform. The next chart is the crawler transporter, which we use to transport the mobile launch platform to the vertical assembly building and back and forth to the launch pad. Next chart. And now I'm going to spend some time talking about the integration of the shuttle elements. And that occurs, next chart, in the vehicle assembly building. This is where the shuttle hardware essentially comes together. We have two what we call integration cells, high bays, that we can stack the vehicle in. We have two other bays which we use for storage of the external tank. And in the low bay areas, we have some shops and labs. Next chart. Next chart. All right, this is the mobile launch platform being brought into one of the integration cells with the crawler transporter. Next. We then begin the stacking of the solid rocket booster assemblies on the mobile launch platform. They are brought over with the transporter from one of the two surge facilities. Next chart. Give you an idea of that process. We use one of our, our large cranes, raise the, the solid rocket motor assembly, next chart, and we lower it and we put the, the pins essentially in, which is approximately 150 of them around the circumference of the solid rocket booster. Final inspection of the ceiling surfaces is done at this time, again with the factory reps on board before we do the final pinning of the segment interfaces. Next chart. Excuse me. Sure. How well do they fit together? Of course, you constructed them round and everything was okay, but they fell into the sea and so on. And then you bring them together. Do they still fit perfectly? They, how, they, how well? No, sir, they do not always fit the first time. After they are repacked with the solid propellant in Utah and they're transported to KSC, uh, when we get ready to do this process, we do an initial fit check. We have the capability with the sling to hold the segment with either two points or four points. We have found many times that when we try to mate these due to out around conditions, we have to, to demate, change the sling positioning, and let the segment sit for some period of time, maybe even up to three hours, and then come back down and do the mate again. So they do not always mate the first time. And again, when we give you a detailed presentation on the actual history of these segments, we'll, we shall go through that with you. Why did you change the launch pad on this occasion? This, this particular one, we've been working on launch pad uh, B, which is our new pad, last used in Apollo for over a year. And it's part of our process to increase the flight rate to get two launch pads online. This was the first opportunity to use the new launch pad. It was completed in December of 85. Was it identical with the previous one? It's identical from the standpoint of, of looks and function. At the time we, we did the launch, there were still some differences in the buildup of the Centaur modifications to make the two pads identical and the rain protection systems. Uh, getting into more detail, functional components on each pad due to vendor change out, you would find some differences there, but functionally the same. Next chart. Okay, the external tank comes in via barge from <coughs> Louisiana, usually uh, many weeks, sometimes months before we stack it in the vehicle assembly building. Next chart. Again, we use the cranes, put it in the storage cell and remove it. Next chart. And attach it to the two solid rocket boosters. Next chart. We bring the orbiter in from the processing facility. Next. 
Attach the slings, retract the landing gear. Next. Lift it. Next. And lower it and attach it to the external tank attach points, the three that were, were uh, described before. Next chart. Once we've completed a verification of all those new interfaces, which is fairly small amount of time, and for the Challenger flow, it was the nominal four to five days, uh, we roll to the to the launch complex. Next chart. And that's that's what I'll describe next. Next chart. Here's our two launch pads. The one to the right is launch complex B. Again, last time we used that was in the Apollo program. Uh, but again, uh, to to repeat, the mobile launch platform, which is the launch mount for the vehicle has been used a number of times, and we had had it to the launch pad previous for some fit and interface verifications before we did the stacking for this mission. Next chart. A few words about the, the facilities there. Uh, the water systems, we have three water systems. Sound suppression water, which is a quench to uh, deaden the shock wave uh, at liftoff of the solid rocket boosters. Uh, we have what we call a potable water system, which is primary safety showers and eye washes and faucets. And we have a firefighting system, which we refer to as the fire rec system. The, the night of the launch, our procedure in order to maintain those three capabilities was to establish a bleed through all of those systems, much as you would a water faucet when freezing conditions were imminent and routed most of that water over to our drain system. Our drain system is not what we call a closed loop system, though. It dumps out on some of the platforms on the west side of the service structure, and we did notice a lot of ice out there, and that was one of the reasons for the additional ice inspection we did late in the launch count on the launch day. Next chart. As we... Uh, go up to the launch pad with our crawler transporter mobile launch platform. We have the capability to keep the vehicle level. Next chart. And set it down on the pedestals at the launch pad and remove the crawler transporter. Next chart. Was there any uh, concern for, for uh, the orbiter being out on pad B without the, the rain protection that it would have had on pad A? We, we did have that concern, of course, we waterproofed the orbiter thermal protection system before the rollout from the orbiter processing facility. And our criteria, since all of the rain protection modifications were not in place, that after each rain, we would go out and reinspect the water protection system, which is sprayed on the tile of the orbiter. And we did that oh, three or four times. We'll have to get you the exact data on that between the time we rolled out to the launch pad on the weekend of December 21st until the launch on the, on the 28th of January. Following up on Ms. Van uh, Ride's question, I gather that the rain protection system on one launch pad is different from the other. Yes, it is. The plan is to get them both the same. Launch pad B, the one we launched from, the, the modifications were not complete. One of the operations we perform at the launch pad is the integration of the payload into the orbiter. And this was done for the Challenger mission the way, the way it is normally done. Uh, use a payload canister, the, up, the interim upper stage, IUS, and the TDRS satellite were brought to the launch pad in the canister such as this. And that was done before the orbiter and shuttle arrived there. Next. They are uh, removed from the canister and installed in the orbiter using our ground handling mechanisms, and that was a normal procedure. Next chart. Say a little bit about our launch processing system, which supports all of the shuttle flow from the orbiter processing facility to the launch pad. Next chart. Launch processing system, again, is primarily maintained by the Grumman Corporation. Uh, the next chart. The, the heart of the system are these consoles. Each engineer, when they perform their systems checkouts per the design center requirements, use their procedures and their software 
whether the orbiter's in the processing facility, the vehicle assembly building, or the launch pad. We have four of these control rooms. Two of them are configured for a launch process. Uh, the control room we launched from on the Challenger mission had been used many times before. Next chart. That's a photograph of the control center. Of course, on launch day, all of those positions are consoles are manned. There's approximately 150 people in the control room at launch time. Next chart. A little bit about the post-launch activity for the SRB retrieval. Next chart. We have a disassembly area located over on the Air Force installation at Cape Kennedy. Next chart. We retrieve the solid rocket boosters from the ocean. We have three retrieval ships currently here. One of them is designated to go to Vandenberg, but there are currently three on site at Kennedy. The Martin Thiokol people are principally in charge of this operation of the retrieval. Next chart. We, uh, we write the, the booster assembly and tow it back to the Port Canaveral. Next chart and take it into this facility, is lifted out of the water, goes through a rinse down process, and then a disassembly, a cleaning, and a refurbishment process. The Martin Thiokol people essentially finish their part of the disassembly and retrieval process at the time they turn it over to United Space Boosters and the Marshall contractor who performs the refurbishment of the segments, which go back to Utah, are the aft assemblies and the forward assemblies, which have the electronics in it. Uh, originally, the retrieval program was based on economies, I assume. We felt it was, country thought it was cheaper, less expensive to do it that way. Uh, is that still the case? Is it cost effective? Yeah. Well, I probably ought to defer to Marshall to get you the actual data on that. We say for us, for our operation at Kennedy, it is relatively inexpensive how the money stacks up on the reuse and retest of the hardware versus new. Uh, that was the original plan, obviously. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the dollars would add up. We'll have to get you that. Because I've heard, what's that? I was talking to the captain of the retrieval operation the other day, and his calculation, they retrieved slightly in excess of $1 billion worth of hardware. A year? Total. Of the whole program? But I mean, I, I would assume that since since that program started, there would be uh, it would be uh, there would be improvements made so that the cost of, of buying new ones would have decreased. In other words, have we f do we know whether it's still uh, desirable from a standpoint of dollars? The figure not? that I was quoting would be the cost of the brand new steel cases and all, not the total. Yeah. Figure again. Well, I think that I think the commission would like to have that. If we could get some accurate figures on that, uh, on whether if you instead of continuing the retrieval program, you went to a program of uh, buying original boosters, would it be how much would it cost, and would it be difficult to put into effect? Mr. Chairman, we've got uh, economic analysis that we've done and so forth, and we'll be happy to provide the, this commission what we think the economic trade-offs are relative to retrieval or not retrieving this hardware. Thank you. How, how long an interval <clears throat> in days or hours or whatever between the final assembly of the system and the rollout to the uh, launch pad? Well, in the case of Challenger, we'll have to get you that data in the case of 51L, that's what yes, I mean. Yes, for, for 51L, we completed the stacking of the, the solid rocket motor segments in the vehicle assembly building approximately the first week in December and then made it the external tank. And again, we rolled out to the launch pad the weekend of the 21st of December. Now, going back further in the, in the genealogy of those casings, whenever they were delivered from Utah, we'll have to retrieve that data for you. After these things splash into that salt water, and I assume they're still hot, and they get towed around by a, a ship, and you wash them down, but uh, do you do any detailed structural analysis to make sure the 
the load, the design loads haven't changed? Well, I ought to defer to, to Marshall on that, but they, there is a complete inspection done at this Air Force facility before the segments are shipped uh, out of Florida. Is that just a visual inspection? Or? That's primarily a visual inspection and, and a cleanup of the uh, insulation. The process back at, uh, at Martin Thiokol in Utah will have to get you a, a briefing on that what they do with the segment casings and the repacking of the grain. Is all the refurbishment done uh, in Florida and then the refurbished casing sent back to, to Utah for packing? Or is some of the refurbishment done in, in Utah? Do you know? It's split up some. So there's some done here by the Marshall contractors over at Cape Kennedy and the remainder's done back in Utah. And the, the same applies for those assemblies which have the electronics in it, the aft and the forward. Those are primarily done here uh, in Florida, but again, by the Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, what you've been describing for the last 20 or so minutes is, is really a fantastic uh, example of teamwork and hands-on experience in processing the shuttle after flight and getting it ready for launch. In the early days of the program, that was done by the people who built and designed the shuttle, those three element contractors. <laughs> Uh, we then decided to compete uh, to get the price down. Uh, could you describe uh, how well did we do in retaining that old hands-on experience, those old pros that, that had processed this before as we changed contractors? Well, the, the specific percentage of retention of the workforce, I think we'll have to get you the exact number there. It was approximately 85%, but there were some disciplines that had a higher percentage than others. Uh, when, when the contract change was made and the shuttle processing contractor Lockheed took that over, they got predominantly all of the hands-on workforce. A lot of the management and engineering, uh, those percentages were less. Uh, but the point to be made, a number of those people, particularly the key ones, remained at Florida as part of the launch support services contract under the design centers and they are still there as part of the processing even though they are not in line in a management function on the minute to minute hour by hour uh, work i noticed there was a, a leak in the appeared to be a leak about the lockheed at some inquiry that you were conducting uh when will that inquiry be finished and will it be available to the public the i'm sorry the the inquiry on on what sir on, it was previous uh, inquiry about Lockheed's performance in some, it was uh, in the paper, I guess, two days ago. Well, maybe uh, I ought to explain the process. We, we evaluate Lockheed. Well, every let me, let me yes, speaking Mr. Chairman, if I might, let me introduce Dick Smith, uh, Senate Director of the Kennedy Space Center. Fine. You want to swear me in? <laughs> <laughs> That's better. Yeah. You swear the testimony you will give this commission be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth, South Dallas. I do. We just did that for uniformity. I understand completely. We did have a handling incident uh, back in November, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, we completed our internal investigations of that. Uh, I approved that in uh, around the mid December, and I don't remember the specific date right now. Uh, we typically send that to headquarters for our uh, review up there before we release it. That process is going on at this time. I have, on a preliminary basis, already implemented, started implementing all the recommendations and would make modifications if there were any additional judgments to that. And the question is, will that report be made public? That report is public document after the final approval by the headquarters people. Yes, sir. Thank you. I believe that completed my presentation. Let's see, next chart. Okay, just a few words about our offline support facilities, a large logistics building, which we just completed to maintain our spares. The hypergolic main maintenance facility is a special facility we use to handle the orbiter maneuvering system pods on the orbiter and the forward RCS because of the nature of the hypergolic fuels. We do not do maintenance on those systems in the orbiter processing facility. We remove them offline. And the 
parachutes from the solid rocket boosters. We retrieve those, clean them, repack them, and reuse them. And that completes my presentation. Any questions? questions. Uh, could you say something about the venting of the gases from the solid, from the um, external tank for okay, during, during launch? Okay, during our launch countdown process, when we load the external tank, liquid hydrogen and oxygen, the, uh, the hydrogen tank venting is contained through an, an arm uh, with a disconnect that, that essentially is cut loose at liftoff. And all that hydrogen venting is, is contained, and it goes through a burn-off system, which in the case of Launch Complex B, we call a flare stack. And it is contained in that system throughout the loading, and we have sensors around that umbilical and at the interfaces with the orbiter where we load it to detect any, any leakage. The oxygen system, the oxygen, liquid oxygen tank is on the top. We have what we call a beanie cap that fits over the top of the external tank and it has an inflatable bellows to contain all that oxygen and it also is vented through an arm and to the outside at the, the same level as the top of the Mr. Chairman, continuing on with our planned agenda, we'll talk about the design and development process uh, for both hardware and software as well as the review process and safety process. We will try to abbreviate this uh, process to try to give the Commission a flavor of it and uh, to show that it is in general applicable to all the flights but also applicable to the 51L Challenger mission. I'd like to introduce Thomas L. Mosier, Director of Engineering at the Johnson Space Center. I do. Mr. Mr. Thank you. Glad to have Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, my organization at the Johnson Space Center provides technical support to the Shuttle Program Office and to the Arbiter Systems in, in particular. What I have done today is I've constructed for you and for the Commission an overview of the design development certification process, as Jess said, which is applicable across the board to all flights and in particular to 51L. I hope that this uh, presentation can give you an insight into the, into the process by which the design development is conducted and will also give you a feel for the wealth of information that exists in the program, which I think you would want to pursue in more depth. If I could have the next chart, please. Well, I'd like to talk to you briefly about the requirements I'll give you a feel for how they're established, the reviews which are conducted during this requirements and design process, the verification which demonstrates that the capability by test and analysis proves the design, the safety process which I think is very important that you understand is independent of the program, it's independent of the technical organization that does an independent assessment and audit, and then give you an overview of the external committees which have looked over our shoulders. The next chart please. And the next chart, please. Now we're on the, an overview of how the process evolves from the definition phases, uh, which essentially establish the level one requirements that Mr. Moore controls, the technology which was developed in parallel to that. Uh, for example, this is where the work was done on a thermal protection system that's in establishing the advanced capability and the enabling technology for the shuttle program. There was not a lot of enabling technology developed for this program. It was pretty much on the shelf. The design and development process is the big phase in the program, uh, which established the detailed requirements of the individual elements in the individual systems. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that later on. The ground test program then establishes through ground testing and analysis that the design as established meets the requirements that have evolved over the program. The flight test program then provides a verification that those ground tests are in fact adequate to meet all the requirements. And then the orbital flight test uh, during the early phases did that very thing. The next chart please. All of these requirements for the, for the Commission's information are delineated at the very top level and are traceable all the way down through the various levels through the different elements that we've talked about today. The, the orbiter, the external tank, the solid rocket booster, 
the engines, the launch and landing site facilities. It is then goes down into the next level of detail into the subsystems. For instance, the hydraulic system in the orbiter, the electrical power system in the orbiter. Those requirements are very, very well delineated and documented in a, in a uh, series of documents by each one of the projects. Next chart, please. In addition to those general requirements, there are specifications which go down to the same level of all of the flight elements and including the support equipment for the program. These specifications not only address the interface specification between the various elements, for instance, the interface hardware between the orbit and external tank as an example. Uh, in addition to that, the specification for the detailed subsystems are also included in these specifications. Next chart, please. There's a, a series of documents which are maintained and controlled at the three different levels of the program which establish the baseline. This is an active system. Anytime changes are made in the system uh, for any reason, those documents are kept up to date. Uh, the the center, center series of documents, which is in your handout, uh, are the technical requirements. Complementing that are the NASA uh, management requirements and also the resource requirements, which, is, which uh, ensure the program meets its requirements. The next thing in this uh, overview and generic presentation, and I'm going to go through this, Mr. Chairman, very quickly in, in response to your request to try and keep it applicable to 51L to, so that you can see what's available, and there was a few things I would recommend that you pursue in more detail. The next chart, please. I think it's important to emphasize that is the time phasing chart indicated to you that the initial requirements are established and the detail requirements are confirmed and set into place as the design evolves. Uh, the chart that's on the uh, monitor at this time shows how the engineering organization, both of NASA and the contractors, are establishing the details and then they're provided to the program manager at various milestones throughout the program. These, these milestones are identified along the lower portion of that chart. Uh, they're acronyms. Let me just tell you in a few words what they are. The, the program requirements review are, what is, are established early in the program. That evolves all the way down to detailed design reviews, which are baseline in the program, somewhat time phase lagging as the technical community establishes those. But that is what is documented and established in the, in the documents I've mentioned to you previously. The next chart, please. The next three charts delineate exactly what those reviews consist of, who chairs them, how they're approved, how they're modified, and what program elements are involved. Uh, let me have the next chart, please. And the next, these are just definitions of those uh, major review milestones. The next, please. Now, into once the design is established, the next process is to, is to verify that that design does, in fact, meet the requirements and also, Mr. Chairman, to establish what the capability of that system is. And I think on any one of these systems that you've been talked with, talked to about today, there's a wealth of information and, and long presentations which should be made to you establishing how those capabilities have been established based on the things which are delineated on this chart, namely the ground testing, the analysis, the checkout, and the flight demonstration. Next chart, please. Comparable to the requirements in, in the establishment of those, all of those that they in fact do meet uh, the various levels of, of requirements from from level one all the way down to level three. There's a well-documented path which is traceable for the certification of each one of the elements. Here we've not only taken the elements and the subsystems, but we've cross-correlated, if you will, each one of those systems with the environments to which it must be proven to uh, work in. And that is, that is shown on the integrated system verification. The next chart, please. As, as the verification is established, uh, each one of the elements focuses on those things 
which affect its design and affects the design of the total system. For instance, the loads, the thermal, the acoustics, the vibration, etc. This is done in a total system sense and provided to each one of the elements. The way in which all of these loads and environments are combined is, uh, is unique with each one of the elements, and that is probably a half a day presentation to this commission on any one so that you can adequately understand that. Okay, go to the next chart, please. And the next. It's important to highlight on any one of the specific components how it interfaces with the other systems, how it is traced through a total verification logic from the initial flight requirements, design requirements, to the environments in which it must uh, live, its particular mass properties and so forth to establish the design loads, the design conditions, and the tests which verify that uh, capability. Once those things are done on the ground, the important thing to recognize is, is that whole process then is verified with flight data from the, from the test program. This was constituted primarily with the first four flights of the, of the orbiter system um, and correlated back with the analysis. Can there I were a few a surprises during that program. Um, yes, sir. This process uh, was used in the, uh, in the design and development of the uh, basic program. Yes, sir. When you got to uh, these weight-saving programs, and what not did you use as complete a process when you made those changes also? The answer to that is yes, sir. Uh, each one of those elements that had significant changes so that it would affect the conditions or the loads or the environment to which it was designed was reanalyzed and gone through the same process. That is correct, sir. Okay. The next chart, please. And the next, that just shows the verification process from the flight data back to the design. The next chart, please. Independent of this total engineering uh, task that I have just uh, walked you through very, very quickly, is another pro process which goes on independently of that organization and independently of the program office, and that is the safety operations. They do an assessment of the design from the very beginning. They participate in all the designs, the design reviews, and the certification reviews. They, in concert with the technical organizations, sign off on the adequacy of each one of the systems and subsystems in the program that it, in fact, does meet its design requirements. In addition to that, this, this organiza organization does a complementary set of analysis, which is highlighted in a box called complementary analysis. There's some acrony acronyms there uh, which are important. They do a failure modes and effect analysis of the system to understand what the impact of a failure of that system is. If there's something that comes out of that, it's identified in a critical items list of which there are various categories of criticality of functions. A category one means that loss of a component or a function would mean loss of the vehicle or loss of the crew. Category two means loss of the mission and category three means something like loss of data. Those are all documented along with the analysis on the criticality of all the components in the, in the program. If I could have the next chart, please. Uh, the next chart uh, entitled uh, the external gives you a feel for, in addition, gives you a feel for uh, the involvement by are these reviews uh, made of... If you are just joining us, it is about 4 o'clock in the East. We have spent much of this day listening to the proceedings of a presidential commission looking into the tragedy of the Challenger Space Shuttle. The witness is Thomas Moser, Director of Engineering at the Johnson Space Center. He has taken note of a request from William Rogers, who heads the panel, a request that witnesses spend less time on satellite or rather shuttle program history and focus instead on the ill-fated Challenger mission. This panel, after all, was given only 120 days to make its report to uh, President Reagan. these committees have participated in the reviews of those anomalous conditions with us. Have there been reviews of uh, solid rocket boosters on any of the shuttle flights or uh, in 
assembly and testing generally. Sir, I, I would like to refer that to, yeah. to that program, to that project office, if I may. And we will get that answer for you. Is it just safety reviews? <coughs> Listed below in not as much detail because I did not I have time to prepare that for you are other committees which uh, have uh, participated in, in an oversight or assessment, some of which are ongoing at this time. Mr. Chairman, I... Are the wrecks maintained here in Washington, or would they be in Kennedy or where? Both places? Uh, the, the answer to that is both places. Some records are maintained here, sir, and some are at others of the field centers. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, for our final presentation this afternoon, I'd like to talk about the flight preparation process with some specifics related to the 51L and again give you a little bit more feel about some of the specific aspects we go through for the flight and preparing it uh, to get ready for launch, as well as talk to a little bit more detail about anomaly tracking and so forth. To do that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Richard Coors. He's the deputy manager of the National STS Program Office at the Johnson Space Center. I do. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, Tom Mosier covered the design, <coughs> development, and verification, and that continues throughout the program. If we have new changes, to the vehicle or new changes to the process, and that process continues. What I'm going to describe today is an overlay to that is a, is a flight preparation process. And the flight preparation process is really typical of any mission. It varies a little bit depending on the cargo, but, but basically it goes over a year and a half time period. And then I'm going to conclude with showing you the FRR process, at least on an overview scale, of what we used on this 51L mission and how that was conducted and handled. If I could have the next chart, it basically shows at the top, and I only deal with the top bullet, it basically shows that the flight manifest, which is really our mission assignments, is, de is determined by the Level 1 board here in Washington, and it's implemented by the Level 2 uh, system. The way we implement that, is through a document called the FDRD document, which is a flight definition and requirements document. And the next chart will show you a little bit of detail. And I'll point out here that it's this document over here, which is volume three. It's part of our overall configuration control and management system of how we track requirements. The next chart will show you the details of what this flight definition requirements document does. It essentially is, has three phases. The first phase, is to document basically the next year's flights in terms, in terms of the specific flight requirements for that mission, specific characteristics like throttle setting, the number of crewmen, the payload, the cargo, et cetera. The second part of that document looks beyond the first year into the out years, and it basically sets our schedules and our flight manifest for the downstream activity. It will go as far as, as probably today would go to 1989, 1990, and define the missions we have planned, when they're scheduled, et cetera. This allows the projects to plan their, their flight deliveries of their tanks, rockets, et cetera. In addition to that, on the bottom of the chart, it's also used as a general mission planning document, uh, a general docu document for logistics scheduling, et cetera. This document is controlled through our uh, PRCB system, and if you show the next chart, and I apologize, I think the one in your handout is, is not too clear. On the top of the chart, it shows the level one organization, which is here in Washington. In the middle of the chart, it, it shows in the top box in the middle, what we call the level two PRCB organization, which is chaired by the NSTS program manager, who is Arnie Aldrich. And the way we operate, on this mission by mission is we meet daily every noon in Houston by telecon. At those meetings we deal with the activities that are going on with the flight vehicles at Decade and eventually with the flight vehicles at Vandenberg. We deal with all changes to the vehicle. We approve both the hardware and software and to the processing. We approve all waivers and we approve all changes to things like critical items list failure modes, effects analysis, and any other waivers. The next chart 
in, in this year and a half process of, of a flight to flight, we have developed some other program milestones and we have adapted the terminology called freeze points. Freeze points are just a term, but we essentially say for the system to flow in a logical order, we've got to set baselines that are the lower tier of what's in our flight definition requirements document. This chart is, is a busy chart, but briefly, uh, it lists in the first column what we're freezing by this time frame. If you look across the top, we freeze things at 66 weeks, which is basically freezes the cargo. At 33 weeks, we have something called a cargo integration review, where it's the next step of freezing that uh, mission definition. At L minus 22 weeks, we go into the crew compartment and freeze things that are added to the crew compartment, like student experiments, fill up the lockers, et cetera. The second one from the right is a major milestone, and that terminology up there stands for the OPF, which is your Arbiter Processing Facility, roll in minus four weeks. And what we have learned over the years is to get a logical modification to the flight vehicles, we need to define our engineering and our changes that the CAPE needs to accomplish, and we shoot to do that at four weeks before roll-in, which normally is in the order of two to three months before launch. And finally, at the L minus 10 week time frame, we once again have a review of the ascent design. And primarily, it's to reflect any late, late changes into maybe cargo that we've loaded on that might change our performance. We always try to launch, optimize launch probability in terms of our upper winds and our atmosphere. Normally, and I, I would say in our 24 flights, that at L minus 10 review, we probably have only changed the ascent design maybe four or five times. And a very minor change is normally a, a small update to the, uh, to the ascent trajectory. The last three lines on the bottom lists, lists the OPR, which is the Office of Primary Responsibility for the Level 2. Those offices are all within the Level 2 organization. That's the code there is just different organizations. The record that we document this is listed in the second column across the bottom. And it shows how we keep track. We update the FDRD. We update the drawings. This nomenclature of MEXI and MESLSI and CCCD are really drawings that reflect the configuration of the cargo below the payload bay, cargo above the payload bay, and the cargo that's in the, in the crew cabin. In addition to that, we also baseline for each vehicle, for each flow, the drawings for that particular flow for both the Arbiter, the ET, SRB and external tank. Those drawings are maintained and controlled, and that repository is at uh, Kennedy. How closely have you been able to stick to these um, launch minus weeks in the, oh, say, flights over the past year? I think if you were to uh, take, uh, if you were to look at one particular flight, say 61C or 51L. The L, um, the as we get closer to launch, of course, we stick closer to them. But I think in the back in the CIR time frame, because of some of our remanifesting and some of our launch abort type things we've had here. We've had to go back and readjust and do what we call delta reviews because we've had to change our manifest. I know that we've been doing a lot of remanifesting lately and, and compressing these, uh, these schedules quite a bit and getting things like uh, uh, cargo integration reviews actually very close to flight. Well, that's, that's right, Sally, but most all those cases, it's due to some programmatic change that in a lot of cases is beyond the system's control. Uh, for example, on 50, somebody helped me on the Tedris flight that we were going to fly last Jan January. We had actually rolled out to the pad and we were a week before launch and the system decided that Tedris needed to roll back for some modifications. That, which was two weeks before launch, upset our process, if you will, and created a series of delta reviews that we had to perform in order to get back into our normal, how do we do business. The, the next chart, and I have a series of charts, then get into the flight readiness. And this first chart is an overview, and I'll just touch on a few points. And in the subsequent charts, I'll go into a little bit more detail of what we typically do at one of our, our major centers. And the example I'll use will be the Marshall Space Flight Center. But basically, prior to every flight, and, and normally it's L minus one week, launch minus one week, the Associate Administrator for Space Flight, in this case, Jess Moore, conducts, conducts a detailed flight readiness review 
with all the shuttle elements, the, the flight operations, and the cargo managers, and their contractors. The, each of these project managers and element managers, and I've listed here what the basic content is. I, I won't read that to you. I'll get into a little bit more detail on subsequent charts. And then at that review, there's normally a series of open action items. Those open action items are documented by the board with the requirement that all open actions be closed out before or at the L minus one day review, which Jess and Arnie talked about earlier, which is our launch minus one day mission management team. At that review, we formally close those actions. They're signed off. Each project and element manager again states his readiness for flight. That readiness is a matter of record in our, in our documentation. And then the commit to flight again is reaffirmed at, at the L minus one. The next and couple all of this was done, I assume, prior to the challenge. Yes, action. sir. This, this process is typical of our 25 uh, uh, launch attempts, 24, 25 launches. We also do this same type of a process that Tom mentioned if we have a major test, like a te we call it a test readiness review. We're going to do a cluster engine firing of three main engines, which are scheduled in the next month or so. That also will get into this review process and get the same level of detail and documentation. The, the next couple of charts, or five charts, show typically how Marshall, and, and this is typical of Marshall and Johnson and Kennedy, established their flight readiness review process. And, and the first chart, which is up there, shows on the bottom that the prime contractors, element contractors, have their own internal review. The Shellman Element Project, which is the first project that reports to Dr. Lucas, has their review. I'm sorry, the, each shuttle element project, ET, SRB, and SSME has a review. That goes to the shuttle project office, then goes to the center director for his review. It comes to the level two office for a pre-review, and then goes to just more as an FRR review and, and culminates at the L minus one day review. The next chart shows for each of those uh, who chairs the FRR, and the thing of note is, on the first one, which is the contractor, it's chaired by a level of management that's at least one higher level than the project manager for that system. The, the shuttle element projects are chaired by the project manager for the three elements, and the, and the project's office chairs the FRR, which leads up to the center director's review, and I've included on the next chart the typical membership which is really the main line organization of the Marshall Space Flight Center. The next two charts show in a little bit more detail the purpose and the content of the review, but it's basically the compatibility of the mission requirements with the hardware cert and the experience base we've had. Experience base for the engines, tank, arbiter, et cetera. The hardware pedigree is determined, and I've listed there. It deals with the changes that have occurred, any waivers and deviations. ME, MR there is material review, review actions on, on materials and also limited life items. Anomalies, and, and Judd talked earlier, sometimes, sometimes called observations, are also reviewed and dispositioned and documented rationale as to why that anomaly closeout is acceptable to allow us to fly on the next flight. Also on the next chart is a safety and RQA review, which Tom Mosier mentioned is, is basically independent of the mainline program, but is reported to the center director institutionally. And then the review of all unplanned open work that still remains before launch. And then it goes over the support operations at the uh, Kennedy Center, and we'll go over the operations at the Vandenberg Center when it's operational. And then each element completes what we call a certificate of flight worthiness. Now, the, the level of detail of the certificate of flight worthiness goes all the way down to the subsystem managers. As Tom Mosier mentioned, is that we will have in the backup documentation a statement that the OMS subsystem manager or the APU subsystem manager on the SRB, he and his contractor counterpart have attested that this vehicle is, is ready for flight. That culminates up to the project managers, and then on the FRR day, and this next chart is the end product of that review, and I won't deal with the signatures on there, but basically what it says is that each contractor 
on the left-hand column in each NASA project manager signs this endorsement for flight. This particular page is signed on the bottom, signature of Arnie Ard Aldrich, who is a level two program manager. And after that review, Jess Moore then, who chairs this meeting, and if I show you the next chart, conducts a verbal readiness poll of all of the contractors that are listed on the top of the page that are directly involved with the next launch. And this sheet happens to be the sheet from 51L, where he has polled these contractors listed on the top. He's polled the payloads and their managers listed in the middle. And down below, the, the de Department of Defense, the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel. In this particular case, they did not attend that 51L. They normally do. Any consultants to the administrator or to the uh, associate administrator, chief engineer, data tracking, and the center director, and finally the center directors. Based on this poll being conducted, the signed certificate of flight readiness, any open actions are documented, which are closed at the L minus one. And the final chart I had is with just more signs to attest that this flight configuration, the procedures are ready for flight. And this is an example. It's, it's typically done for, for every mission and for every major test that we conduct. Thank you. Are these reviews that you speak of, do they result in a written report? Yes, sir. Written minutes with written action items. And that, of course, would be available to it's us. available for the record. We can, uh, back to any flight that we've had or any, any major test, that data is available. No. The action items and the closing. Have you ever fired any contractor or subcontractor for poor performance? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, someone else may want to help me on that, but not to my knowledge. Uh, are you permitted to contractually? Do you have a provision in the contract that permits you to fire contractor or subcontractor for poor performance? I believe we do, and in some of our contracts, our, our incentive contracts, some of them are award fee contracts, and you have your mechanisms for, for dealing with any abnormal performance in that way also. But to my okay. knowledge, Jess, I don't recall anybody that uh, used the word fired for, for, for uh, poor Well, terminate, maybe. Uh, I'll have to look for help on that. I, I don't, I'm just wondering, I think, whether, uh, whether you're pretty well locked into contractors and subcontractors contractors by the mere fact that they are in that position, or whether you have any option to terminate a contract if you find poor performance. Well, as, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Kennedy contracts were just recompeted into a single processing contractor, and the just effective January 1st of this year, I think, Arnie, the uh, Houston contract, major support contract, was recompeted uh, and awarded the 1st of January, and actually put into implementation the 1st of January. This but year. the law allows you termination for convenience of the government. I think that's right. That's right. An exercise. That's right. Question? I noticed in the example here, the, the checkoff sheets that you Xeroxed, that most of the signatures are dated 15 January, a few are dated 23 January. Do you have a mechanism then prior to a launch on the 28th, for instance, to go back and make sure that these are still valid certifications? Yes, yes, sir. And, and the reason you don't see all these filled out is, we, like Arnie said earlier, we do a lot of our meetings by telecon. The people where you see the signatures were at the meeting that day. The, where it says endorsement attached, it was sent in through the mail system, and the record has all of those attached endorsements. Mr. And then, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, so I had a question as to what occurs after a flight. Uh, you have a lot of data, and I presume there's some procedure for analyzing and evaluating that data. After each flight, the, uh, the anomalies are tracked. The anomalies, if they affect the next mission, automatically flow into this process for the next mission. Each project writes a, a flight status report or summary report for the previous mission, and that normally is documented, uh, I would say, in, in the average within 30 to 40 days after the flight. Any hardware items that are removed from the vehicle go into another tracking system, which the arbiter calls CAR, which is customer action request, and tracks the hardware that's removed and tracks its disposition, especially if it was involved with anomaly closeout. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> um.
Mr. Chairman, that uh, completes our planned briefings for today to uh, go through the process to give you some uh, feeling of what we go through to get ready for a flight, to talk to you a little bit about the uh, activities that we're doing in NASA with respect to the Challenger uh, uh, accident. And uh, as we said earlier, we'll be happy to provide you any additional information that you need and support your commission uh, in any way you deem fit. Well, thank you. I compliment you and your associates. We appreciate it very much. We know that we gave you a very short notice, and I think it's been a very worthwhile and, and effective presentation. Thank you. Just, that's it for the day. Testimony from top NASA officials, much of it a kind of primer on the space shuttle system. But they quickly discounted recent speculation that below freezing temperatures on launch day might have contributed to the accident. We had no concern for uh, uh, performance or safety of the flight articles uh, at that time, nor do I even at this time. Although they admitted the solid rocket fuel is not meant to be used in temperatures below 40 degrees, they said the bulk mean temperature at launch time was well above that. And they said while there was some concern that rubber O-rings used to seal the rocket joints might be affected by the cold weather, shuttle managers and Morton Thiokol, who make the rocket boosters, were convinced there was no problem at a meeting the night before launch. And the discussion centered around the integrity of the O-rings under lowered temperature. And Thiokol recommended uh, to proceed in the launch. Today, shuttle managers also finally corrected the impression, wrongly left by some, that Challenger's crew members could have escaped death. They said it is impossible to separate the solids from the orbiter before the boosters have burned out because it wouldn't separate cleanly. And you'd have contact between the various elements, particularly the orbiter wings and the back part of the orbiter. And it's thought to be unsurvivable. Today, ABC News also obtained these photographs taken by a member of the search team aboard one of the Coast Guard vessels. Most of the photographs appear to show Challenger's tiles and thermal protection system. And the photographer says that this helmet, which looks like those worn aboard, was also found. NASA continues to refuse any comment on personal effects retrieved from the sea. Lynn Scher, ABC News, Washington.